is our first official uh, guest, and we're happy that she could join us. And I will update everyone on the other presenters, and pretty much it's filled out. Um, so uh, you'll get an email on that. So we've got sort of an interesting this conversation going on today, and all of us are going to be involved in it. But I'm going to let Julie get started. She was kind enough to start us out last semester. Uh, we did this project, and so she came, and we had a great dialogue, and we thought we wanted to have it again. So, Julie, I'm going to let you get started, sure. and then people can kick in, and then Danny Kane is here, and he will tell you why he's here in a minute as well. <laughs> <laughs> they yeah. know each other. Yes, right? we do know each other, yes. Yes, well, as you know, thank you, Mary Emma, for inviting me back. I'm Julie Mulvihill. I'm the Executive Director for the Kansas Humanities Council. We're a nonprofit organization that uh, is located in Topeka, and our job is to prov provide access to and resources for communities all across the state who are interested in creating uh, and implementing humanities projects. And that's it in a nutshell. We believe that history and ideas and traditions shape us and inform us as individuals, but they also strengthen civic life. And so when Mary Emma sent me an email about coming to this class, she asked me to kind of talk about three different things. Um, what drew me to this work, which is easy for me to say. Uh, what exactly is the path to getting there? A little bit more difficult for me to add. <laughs> and what special preparation do you need to have a career like mine? And so I'll try and hit those three points. And if I confuse you at any point, just stop me. Let's make this informal discussion. And if I go on too long, Mary Emma, just give me the high sign and I'll wrap it up. So <laughs> um, the Kansas Humanities Council is celebrating its 45th anniversary next year. And we're really proud of that. We're an affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, which is a federal agency. And the National Endowment for the Humanities had this charge in 1970 or 1965 when they were created with their founding legislation. The idea was is that democracy demands wisdom and vision in its citizens. That gives me chills. I've said that a hundred times, and it still gives me chills. So when Mary Emma asked me, what draws you to this work? That statement right there is really exciting for me. Democracy demands wisdom and vision in its citizens. And we believe that you achieve this, of course, through the humanities, right? That these are the tools in which we can help citizens gain these opportunities. The State Humanities Councils came into existence a few years after the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the idea was is that we were put here to illuminate the conditions of contemporary life, for citizen engagement with the humanities and to illuminate the conditions of everyday life through the humanities. For any of us who love those disciplines, whether it's English, literature, American studies, history, philosophy, that idea that we can use the things that intrigue us and spark ideas in our own minds to somehow um, build civic pride, to strengthen civic engagement, to strengthen communities, that is a really exciting idea. So those are the things that drew me to this work. But, you know, how did I get here? Well, it was kind of a topsy-turvy, long and winding road, and it, it crossed here at KU. I grew up in a far on a farm in Kansas. My dad was a farmer, my mom was a homemaker. Um, they both went to, had gone to college, but chose to, you know, pursue other careers when they became adults. Uh, but no one in our family really pursued the humanities, right? You know, that was not something that farm kids from Kansas generally did, right? Certainly no one that I knew. So I remember when I was in elementary school, um, we took a field trip here on campus to KU, and we went to the Natural History Museum. And we went to this class, um, and at that time it was this public education classroom, very different than what it looks like now. And we learned about the Galapagos Islands. 
Now, I am not someone who's particularly interested in science. It's not what I'm naturally drawn to. It's not my wheelhouse. My affinity is not there. But I was so taken by this field trip that I still remember it as if it happened yesterday. And it was not yesterday by any means, by any stretch of the imagination. And what drew me to that, and as I think about it as an adult, is the incredible moment that I had as a kid in which I saw the big world in front of me. Like it all of a sudden became very concrete. It wasn't about the Galapagos Island tortoises, which is what we were learning about, but this idea that the world existed in front of me. And the person who led the program obviously had a science uh, interest, but I was so enamored by the storytelling of this, you know, how did this come about? Where is, where is this? You know, where in the world is this? And what kind of a place is KU that I could learn about this and what else is there for me to learn about? So I attribute that field trip to really my interest in kind of the all things grander than who I am as an individual. You know, this bigger picture, this sort of universal nature of the humanities. The other thing that I can attribute my path to, uh, to the public humanities world, is the fact that my parents, um, we did not have a library in my small town. The closest library was the Lawrence Public Library here in town. And every Wednesday in the summertime, my mom brought me to the Lawrence Public Library, brought me and my sisters, and we spent however long there, and we could check out any book we wanted at any point in time and we would come back the next Wednesday and check in what we had already finished and check something else out. And it developed a pattern in my life and this love of learning and this love of books and this sense of what can be learned um, in both fiction and nonfiction. And so those are two things that when I think about what started me on my way, um, I think about those two childhood experiences. If we'd speed things up, I ended up coming to KU I tried on a lot of different uh, majors as I was an undergraduate, business, you name it, um, and decided again because I was very interested in history and I was very interested in literature, uh, but I, it wasn't something that my family necessarily <laughs> you know, pushed me toward. I got my undergraduate degree in education. So I was a social studies teacher uh, and I taught for a while, a um, very short amount of time, out uh, in Wyoming on the Wind River Reservation, and I taught Shoshone and Arapaho students. And I was fascinated, once again, by that experience. Um, I was certified to teach social studies and English, of course. There's my, you know, there's my little bit, my little attempt at sort of being a, a humanist there. Um, and learned that I really love teaching, but I was not that good at it really, you know. What makes you a good teacher and a great teacher at that level, middle school, high school, is your willingness and interest in doing all the other things besides teaching, which I had very little interest in. You know, I hate that that's going on videotape, but it's true, right? Um, so, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I loved everything about it, but no, I really did, um, I really did love the teaching part of it, but realized that I was not a very good disciplinarian and I had very little interest in some of those other things. So I came back to what I knew and loved and that was KU and I um, pursued my graduate degree in anthropology and museum studies and historical administration. Yes. So again, one step forward in the humanities, but I couldn't quite commit, so museum studies and historical administration, right? So it's always this sort of compromise that I sort of attribute just to my, my personality and, and my upbringing. That was a really great combination because anthropology gave me that worldview that I've always been interested in, just haven't had the opportunity to um, do all that much traveling, but sort of opened the doors to everything that I find interesting. Uh, and combine that with sort of some training in history and training in literature and English that I really felt that that provided me with a really good basis for where I wanted to go next. I was fortunate enough to um, get a job out of college, out of graduate school, at the Johnson County Museums, suburb of Kansas City, uh, being their curator of education. And it was a fantastic job. It's a sophisticated modern museum, and if you have a chance, you should go. They're getting ready to move to a new location. And that was a really wonderful opportunity for me. And I primarily worked with creating opportunities for um, elementary school age children. 
And from there, I moved to um, the State Historical Society and worked in their education department. And at that time, I was kind of ready for a new, different type of challenge. And so there was a position open at the Kansas Humanities Council, which was this nonprofit organization that, truth be told, I had never heard of before. Um, and I applied, and I became their director of programs. And it was a big switch for me because all of a sudden I was doing out of school programming as opposed to in school programming. And then in 2007, I had the opportunity to become the executive director. And we've made a lot of changes to our organization since I became the executive director, but we've maintained a couple of core values that I think every state humanities council has. And this is something you might want to keep in mind as your careers take off. There's one of us in every state, right? So if this is something that interests you, Think about this. We all share some co common core beliefs, but we all do very different things. We are all, at our core, humanities driven. So everything that we do has some sort of humanities scholarship behind it, some sort of humanities scholar behind it, some sort of research, something that ties us directly into the humanities. Even when we are working on projects that might be more environmental related or other things, at its core, we're looking at the humanities, how we can utilize the humanities to strengthen civic life. So that's one. And the second thing that we do that we're uh, unforgiving with is the fact that we are all about that citizen engagement with the humanities. So unlike sometimes academic pursuits where you're doing research and it's for the good of the whole, right, you know, we are doing research or we are taking research and making it available in some capacity directly with the public. So it might be a speaker's presentation. So it's not a passive situation, it's an active situation. So it might be speakers in history or it might be facilitated book discussions that we do around the state or facilitated film discussions that we do around the state or we've dabbled in uh, reader's theater, we've dabbled in um, turn of the century type of Chautauqua activities. We've done all sorts of different things. The wrapping may be different, but at its core, you're always gonna find those two things. Citizen engagement with, it, with that public humanities, uh, citizen engagement with the humanities, that makes it the public humanities in some degree, and then that humanities um, core. All of what I just said excites me about what it is that we do. Last year, for the state of Kansas, we were able to support 788 humanities events in our state in 127 different communities. That's amazing, you know? The humanities, you are in a great field. There is an interest and a hunger in our state and all around the nation for the type of work that you can provide. A lot of our communities, you know, they're interested in creating something that's uniquely their own, that's rooted in the humanities, and we offer a grants program. We require all of our grant applicants to use what we call a humanities consultant, someone who has a graduate degree in a humanities di discipline. Do we think this person is going to be an expert in Paola, Kansas history? No, that's the point. What you offer as a humanist is this sort of bigger picture, right? You elevate the conversation. You are not mired down into the local. You may not know the players. What you can provide is those, that critical thinking skill, that opportunity to take the research and the training that you've gotten here at KU and wherever you may have been before you came to KU and apply that so that whatever it is that Paola Kansas is planning on doing, it's a film festival, it's a museum exhibition, it's a symposium, it's a whatever. You as a humanist can help provide that opportunity for them to think bigger, right? Because that's what you're good at. You think big, you have big ideas, right? So you can help them achieve those big ideas and elevate it from the local. Um, all of our speakers that are in our speakers bureau that r run around the state, we do gobs of these over the state, 288 I think last year. They're generally people with MAs and some sort of humanities discipline who love their topic, but even more, they love talking about it in museums and church basements and senior citizen groups, uh, at art centers, whatever it might be. 
Um, these are people who just enjoy that engagement. What I hear from the scholars who participate in these sorts of ways um, is that whatever it is that they were talking about, they get that information back. So if we're talking about, um, we have somebody who goes out and, and does something about um, uh, soda fountains, historic soda fountains in Kansas. Very popular in the summer, as you can imagine, right? You know, so wherever she goes, people come up and want to tell her about their local soda fountain. So as a researcher, she all of a sudden has tapped into this resource that wasn't in any other way. You know, so these oral histories that she's been able to do, um, so that as she's achieving kind of her own personal goals, independent research on soda fountains in Kansas, she is able to add to her known body of knowledge each and every time that she goes out because people come and they say, well, did you know about this soda fountain in this town? Uh, we served this and this is what the soda jerks did and this is, you know, and so all of a sudden it's a win-win situation. So whatever you're presenting out, you're going to get an equal amount of valuable information back. So I am a big supporter of the public humanities and the type of work that we do at the humanities councils. Uh, all across the nation. We work with prison populations. We've worked with, you know, all sorts of different populations and community needs. Every state is different. Um, we just kind of work within what, what it is that's presented to us and, and what it is the interest is, and, and we're always willing to be nimble and flexible um, for everything except those two things that I've, I've talked about before, humanities and public engagement. So I'm open to discuss any of those ideas in, in greater detail or, or pass it on to Danny because he's got some first-hand experience of working with the Kansas Humanities Council. So why don't we switch the mic okay. to Danny because sometimes you hear this and it sounds exciting. But Danny, <laughs> and then and you really find out. Yeah. You really find out what it's about. So we thought since we had Danny here, and of course he was in the pilot version of this course last spring, um, when he found out it was actually going to be the intern because it was an application process like everything else is and you have to be selected. So he's now on the other end of that and I thought it would be really good to hear from him in terms of what his experience was like this summer serving as an intern for the Kansas Humanities Council. You need to test this? Stuff. No, that's fine. Hey, good. Okay. okay. Danny, you take it away. Said I was an intern with, with Julia and the other fine folks at the Kansas Humanities Council this summer. I thought I'd say a brief word about how I arrived at that uh, because it wasn't something I set out as a goal to do. Um, although around this time last year, I kind of started to th start thinking about other things to do than being a professor. And so I was, I was reaching out and just looking for, for opportunities and, and, and ways to do that. There was, last December, the Hall Center did a roundtable discussion uh, called, uh, it was something about Applied Humanities or Public Humanities roundtable discussion. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I RSVP'd for it, not being 100% sure what it was or, um, yeah. And then I had this moment um, before leaving the house to go there where I was kind of nervous. And I was like, I don't even know if I want to do this. Am I supposed to put on a tie? Um, which is a really uncomfortable thing for me. And then I did, which was good because everybody else there was like in suits and stuff. But what it ended up being is the Hall Center does a number of internships every summer. It was eight last summer. Um, and they had a representative from each of the sites um, give a talk, take questions. Uh, at the Hall Center, they do this thing called speed dating where like you go around yes. and do these, these yes. small. <laughs> and so I had FaceTime with all eight host sites. Other ones were Lawrence Public Library, Nelson Atkins Museum, Kansas Public Television, uh, things like that. Um, so it was, it was really good for this kind of applied humanities stuff. It was also really good as a networking opportunity with people who were offering money to do work that next summer um, through the Hall Center. Um, and I, I met Julie there. Um, they also, the Hall Center is also really good at little receptions where you, you shake hands and, and mingle. Um, so I applied for the internship. I also did their Applied Humanities Boot Camp. Um, I applied for four different internships. Kansas Humanities Council is when I got. I think it was my top choice anyway. Um, and so then there I was in Topeka at the beginning of July. Um, of, of June. 
Um, so what I did, my main task was the one of the, the programs that Kansas Community Council does is called um, Museum on Main Street. It's sponsored by the Smithsonian Institution. And what they do is, it's roughly every two years they, they tour an exhibit that's curated and produced by the Smithsonian. Um, and this is designed to get Smithsonian level museum content into smaller towns that don't necessarily have that type of culture. And each town will do their own kind of curating and uh, exhibition to go along. The exhibits are very general. Each museum and house site does their own kind of curating and display work to make it more local interest. Um, one starts next summer. It's called Waterways. It's about the ways that people interact with water. Like I said, it's very general. It has to play in all 50 states. So. Um, the one, uh, Meredith Wiggins, who used to be a grad student in the English department too, wrote for um, one about sports. Um, but it was, I had to write, there were six host sites um, and ten partner sites, which became nine partner sites. Um, partner sites doing related exhibitions but not getting the main touring exhibit. Every site needed a feature story and that was my job to write feature stories. They ended up being about 750 words in length. Um, ostensibly their blog posts. They'll go up on the Kansas Humanities Council blog, coinciding with the beginning of that, that site's exhibit. The sites are also welcome to uh, use it in their, um, in their exhibit. And then it might also go into the Kansas Humanities Council newsletter. But it's just creating written content um, for all of these sites. Um, and that's what I did. This is, this is my summer's work here. <laughs> um, so as you, it's about 65 or 70 pages. Um, so one of the main things I got out of this summer was just some writing that I'm really proud of, which is good. It was like, um, as a writer, the, the opportunities where your full-time job is writing um, are rare. And it was really cool. Like, I wasn't teaching and writing on the side. This was a writing gig. Um, I got to go to s the six host sites, too, to do first-hand research. And I did a lot of online research for the other sites, too. Um, so aside from the, the value of just, you know, you can, I can pass some of this around, too. Uh, most of it's in one packet. Um, and then like there are historical pictures that go along with them, too. Um, so yeah, and that'll start appearing. That stuff will start appearing on the blog next June. Um, it was valuable to me not only because I, I created, I was writing, and I, I created a lot of really good writing that I'm proud of. I also, um, it was a really great glimpse into what it's actually like to work um, in, the, in the applied humanities and the public humanities. Um, so even if I wasn't directly working on other things at KHC, I was privy to a lot of stuff. Um, I got to attend one of the board meetings. Um, it was in Hayes, Kansas, so I got to, I had never uh, really imagined I'd ever go to a board meeting of any type, but <laughs> there I was. Um, Hayes, Kansas. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Hayes, Kansas, no less, which was actually a really fun place to visit um, for a lot of reasons. Um, but not only did I get to see how a, a, a nonprofit's board functions and to actually watch in the room as they conducted business, it was also like I got a lot of view into the prep work and holding a board meeting because like I got to listen as people made arrangements for travel and, and financial stuff and even feeding the board. Um, it was, uh, yeah, like who, the granola bars are in which car is. <laughs> Uh, so, like, every level of that process I was privy to and I got to see how that functioned. And as someone who has been mostly in academic life for the last five years, um, to see, to get a, it was a really great behind the scenes look at how, how uh, a nonprofit like this functions. Um, so, yeah, and then my, my desk was right next to the grant coordinator. So, we talked a lot about, um, like, in his role as, um, what, what, program officer or the director, of grants. director of grants so like he I got to listen to him and talk to him work with people who had received grants and like and actually execute it like I had made it a goal last year to figure out how to write grants because I figured it would be a valuable skill in trying to find a job outside the academy but then it was also I got to see what it's like to execute a grant um, and what's expected on both ends the people getting the money and the people giving the money um, and then also just, and this is another Hall Center thing that they'll tell you if you go to any of those things, is, is networking and connections. Um, I made a huge number of connections, this, not just um, Julie and everyone else at the Kansas Humanities Council, um, but people for, like I met farmers from Colby. Um, Julie and I had a meeting in the Kansas Water Office, like uh, with a view of the, the Kansas Capitol building, like out the window. 
Um, I, I met and had a meeting with the director of the Kansas Geological Survey. Um, I met local historians who are really can be quite adventurous to work with um, and people in, in museums large and small across the state and then just a whole smattering of people all across the state um, very interesting people with really great stories to tell and it was it was really fortunate for me that I got to go out into the field that was by far my favorite part of this work is getting out there and talking to people about things they really care about and a lot of the work they do at Kansas Humanities Council is about storytelling and that ended up being very very compelling for me um, and enjoyable um, this summer so it was a great experience um, tremendously valuable I think I'll be I'll be benefiting from those connections and the things I learned for a long time to come and I was lucky to do it okay so it's your turn to ask questions to, and, and please as you um, Speak. You gotta introduce yourself. You know, we gotta do the record thing. So, all right. Here we go. First question. Yeah. Break the um, ice. I'm Casey Keel. I'm a third year PhD here in Retcom, and so applied humanities is fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I just kind of wanted you. I thought this would be a question geared to you, but I think it's geared to you as well. Um, can you guys speak a bit more about the reciprocity that you guys experience doing this kind of work? Because I got really interested when you said that the researcher who was going around presenting about soda fountains and things like that all across the state was then um, being given information too. And I was just wondering what, how else that looks, um, what do you do with that information? Does that like help sustain the Kansas Humanities Council? I'm very interested in like communal reciprocity and I just kind of wanted you to speak a bit more about that. Sure. Well, in terms of the Kansas Humanities Council as an organization as a whole, in terms of reciprocity, you know, we always say that the only reason we exist is because our communities need us. And ultimately, every nonprofit wishes for the same thing, that you don't need to exist anymore, that every community has that um, upswell of support and opportunities funded in other ways through their local citizens, through their city and county governments, that they don't need another nonprofit to help them support these things. Um, some, I think, probably don't utilize that uh, sense of being able to gain their research back into their own individual research, and some, I think, do it very wisely. Um, we do not play a part in that in directly in terms of being coordinating that in any way, shape, or form. We encourage it when it's possible. We encourage when we do orientations and trainings with our scholars to remind everyone that when you're doing public humanities, you are not in a classroom. This is not a one-way delivery mechanism. You are not just up there standing and talking. And in fact, we work really hard to call them discussions or presentations, not lectures, because we are not interested if you want to come and do your class lecture um, with the public. That's not who we are and what we do. So it takes a certain type of scholar who's even interested in breaking out of the mold, the training that you've often got in the humanities, um, to be comfortable with that, to say, you know what, I'm going to speak for 20 minutes and then we're just going to open it up for questions and answers. Um, and uh, so in terms of reciprocity, it really depends on the individual. Uh, we um, are always, you know, there reciprocity in terms of fundraising that is ongoing. Danny probably heard more about that than he wanted to hear <laughs> about that. Um, but as a nonprofit, that's something that we're always thinking about. So, for example, with the Museum on Main Street collaboration that we do with the Smithsonian, for us to do kind of the Cadillac version is going to be eighty some thousand dollars. Uh, ideally, we'd like to raise all of that privately if we can. Um, that was our goal for the summer. We are so far away from eighty thousand dollars at this point in time, but that's okay because we're you know we're working towards that. But when we are thinking about those host sites that are going to be hosting the Smithsonian, after they're selected, we sit down and we do some strategic research about okay, what foundations might be interested in supporting these particular organizations or their particular story? Because Danny's exactly right. Danny was a great intern for us and being able to find the story that these organizations needed to tell about water. Um, museum professionals, and I count myself as a former one, you know, we often think that when we're telling stories, we have to start at the beginning and, and end at the end. Um, as pure humanists, you understand that good storytelling doesn't start at the beginning and end at the end. You start somewhere in the middle, and you might you might come around full circle, and you might not, right? You know, that it's all about storytelling. 
So the reciprocity, it's just ongoing. It's not packaged nice and neat. I wished I had a stronger answer than that. Um, every individual who participates with us in some capacity does it for different reasons. Personal gain, maybe a little financial incentive on the side. For um, our organizations, the local museums and public libraries and art centers and others who use us, they're getting some gain from it, whether it's an incredible speaker or an incredible event for their community, or it's networking, or it's exposure, or it's being able to tap into the network of people that we uh, know and have access to at the Humanities Council. I mean, it is fun to be able to dazzle Danny by saying, hey, let's go over to the water office and, <laughs> and enjoy the view of the Capitol. Um, uh, so, you know, those sorts of things that we're able to do just because of the nature of our work. So that's a very long-winded. Thank you. Well, let me ask a question while you were thinking, um, Mary Emma Graham. It seems to me that this particular kind of work does not compete with other kinds of humanistic, non-profit-driven mm -hmm. organizations. Right. So then that would be different. I mean, if you think about, you, you know, you're going to start an organization, you're going to start a nonprofit, you are in a world, you know, my daughter works in youth development, so there's a lot of stuff in youth development, the YWCA, the Boys and Girls Club, so this, the, that, the other. But it seems to me in this arena, you're kind of like alone, mm -hmm. or, or am I wrong about not seeing on the whole right. picture here? Right. You know, I, I think that's, I think that's, that's true. And I think that's actually, you know, one of the things that we are working towards as part of our own strategic plan. Whenever you work for an organization, nonprofit or other, you're always going to have a strategic plan. One of the things that we want to position ourselves in doing is being a stronger cultural leader rather than providing only cultural resources. But there's a distinction between the two because we are kind of um, out there on our own in terms of how, what sphere we work within. So um, we're a nonprofit, but we often work with the Kansas Library, State Library. That's a state agency, so they operate much differently than we do, but we have a shared interest. We often uh, collaborate with the State Historical Society. Again, we have shared interests, but they operate as a state agency that's different than us. Um, we have opportunities to work with the universities, um, KU, uh, Kansas State University, and others. Again, shared uh, values and traditions in some ways, but very different in how we operate and organize and uh, those sorts of things. So we are out there a little bit on our own, for good or for bad. When it comes to fundraising, the thing that we're working toward is finding a way to better tell our own stories. So, right, one of the things that we work with our communities is how they isolate their stories and tell them to their greatest advantage, whatever that might be. And so now we're sort of taking a step back and saying, you know, we really need to do that for ourselves too in terms of who do we want to be and how do we express that to the general public in terms of advocacy and lobbying, but also in terms of fundraising and also in terms of sort of um, for the lack of a better term, sort of friend raising, right? You know, sort of friend raising. <laughs> that sort of thing. Uh, and so it's a really interesting place to be right now because we work primarily with organizations, small organizations across the state who are interested and already invested in the humanities. Historical societies, museums, public libraries, art centers. Um, we also work peripherally through those community organizations with other groups. So, for example, we work with the Learned Correctional Facility because there happens to be a program director who's employed by the correctional facility who's really interested in the power of the humanities to change and transform lives within the um, incarcerated system. And we've done this before in the past, Hutchinson Correctional Facility, Lansing Correctional Facility. Uh, and so I always say that our audience and our constituents are boundless, but sometimes we need to have those, you know, kind of those people who can introduce us. Because if you are in a social service type of organization, you're thinking about your needs. You may not be thinking about how the humanities can be applied and make things better, easier, whatever 
or complicate things, who knows. But um, So we're always looking to extend, expand our audience beyond those who already have an affinity towards the type of work that we do. And that gets a little bit challenging uh, because, you know, when you are um, so focused on your work, for example, if your nonprofit is all about making sure that every child in your community has enough food to eat, where do the humanities fit into that? Well, I bet this circle of people could come up with a lot of ways that the humanities could fit into that discussion. But when you're a small staff nonprofit organization whose interest is feeding kids, you might not, as your first choice, go towards the Kansas Humanities Council for help. And so we're trying to think about ways that we can be nimble in our own storytelling, that we can share examples of how we might be able to help in that conversation in other ways. So stay tuned. I think the future of the public humanities might be in those sorts of directions and be extending beyond kind of our known constituency. I think that's the applied part of you know, the public. Thank you. Okay. Comments, questions? Um, Morgan McCall, I'm a first year MA student. Kind of going off, um, I don't know if you're allowed to speak on specifics, but off of what you just said in terms of applied. Um, I thought about nonprofits in reference. I'm from Mississippi, and so we have a lot of issues with like education and the Delta being a food desert and things like that. And there was recently an article that came out in the Clarion Ledger about like the ineffectiveness, or um, I guess that it's necessarily like it might be considered unreasonable to focus on like arts and humanities instead of the pressing needs of like education and people strictly even showing up for public school and getting enough food to eat. So how have you had any successful? I'm um, kind of like applied in that. In that, right. not not saying that. Right. Yeah, right. but. Yeah, that is that is a, such a great question, and it's a classic um, false comparison that, that so many organizations and communities and civic leaders often want to make. Well, we can either support the local museum, or we can build a sidewalk in front of the elementary school that will make it safer, right? Well, that's really a difficult conversation to have. When you pull it out like that, uh, you're giving people no choice, right? And so part of the ways that I think the humanities councils have to do better, and those of us who are interested in this work, is changing the narrative of this, right? It's not that the humanities are in opposition of any of this, right? You know, we are not, it's not either or. We're all about strengthening civic engagement. So part of this, if you're worried about youth in your community, um, whether it's the high rate of incarceration, or there's nothing for the youth to do, or there's all sorts of problems, you know, maybe it isn't just about sidewalks, maybe it's about providing healthy and nutritious food, but maybe it's also about, you know, making sure that every child knows how to read, because we know that if they don't, how much trouble we can go into. Well, there's a place for the humanities right there. Uh, there are lots of entryways for us in the conversation, and what we have to do is be bold in our language to be able to change the narrative uh, that happens at these city and county mission, uh, meetings sometimes, or who's ever holding the, the keys to this sort of funding. And we see it, uh, we get a little bit of state funding, and it happens, you know, uh, where you'll see like, well, you know, we could give some money to the Kansas Humanities Council, or we could give some money, you know, in some other area. And it's like, I can't change your mind, you know, if, if that's your mindset, but let me talk to you about the ways in which we help strengthen the communities that each and every one of you Live. I always talk about that we are not about economic development, although some councils do argue that. Um, we are about citizen development in all that it means. So different councils really see their entry points differently. My colleague in Mississippi, Stuart Rockloff, who is the executive director there, you know, they see their role. They, you will see that they are getting more invested in this um, family literacy program, I believe, called Primetime Family Reading Time. Primetime Family Reading Time takes story time a step farther, where it pairs a humanities professional like you uh, with a trained librarian or storyteller. And you invite kids, and you invite their parents, mm -hmm. and you have supper together, right? So you come to a neutral place, could be the library, could be the community center, could be someplace else. You come to a neutral place, the kids get free books, they get free 
supper, you do some mingling, you know, uh, you might have some door prizes, you might have some games, then you sit down, you read the book, and then you, as a, as a humanist, you teach the parents through modeling how you ask good questions, good, right? Reading is one thing, but critical thinking from reading is a whole different ballgame. And so often some of our kids who are low-level readers, um, they might be able to sit down with their parents and read a book, but it might be sit down and literally just reading the book. Whereas this particular program teaches and models how you ask critical thinking level questions. And the books are dealing with core humanities themes like honesty, fairness, Right? Those sorts of things. So some of our councils who are working within populations that they have identified a very specific need are channeling their funds into that as a way to sort of say, it's not one or the other. We have to do this together. Right? And most of us in the nonprofit world aren't saying, give us all the money we need. Give us some money and we'll match it with somebody else. You know, give us some seed money and we'll find it someplace else. Um, so that's just one example of being able to articulate within your state or within your community where the needs are, and then thinking about what skills and expertise do you have as humanities professionals that tap into that conversation, right? So back to this idea of like feeding kids, like my, okay, so my nonprofit is all about feeding kids. You know, if you need to um, help your community better understand this tradition of where we've been, you know, pull in some humanists who have done research and done some work on, you know, what has this looked like in your community? You know, has there always been an organization that's been there to, to help out those who need a hand up, you know? Uh, what does that look like? Where have we come from? Where are we going? You know, so that you can create an opportunity for community dialogue where it's not just about this organization, but it's about something bigger, you know? Are we morally responsible for providing opportunities for those who need opportunities, right? You know, that is a great question. I mean, those are those big questions that humanities love to wrap their heads around, right? And you know what? Sometimes the general public does too, you know? It's like, what responsibility do we have to one another? To what do we owe one another? Uh, and I think those can just be really great opportunities um, for lots of different uh, avenues. I'll just make an insertion here because um, I happen to know a lot about Mississippi, as you know. But actually, they got a, a national award uh, for the Mississippi uh, Humanities Council because of this partner program they did. They discovered that children spend more time with their grandparents, in, at least in the state of Mississippi, yeah. than they do with their parents. So they have this. The pairing was with the grandparents, mm -hmm. the after-school yeah. programs, and then, of course, it dovetailed into a story stories of these grandparents mm -hmm. and migration and mm -hmm. all the kinds of other intergenerational things. So they really had a, a, a huge hand in paying attention to the literacy, uh, one, the outer school population, um, you know, key latchkey, so-called latchkey mm -hmm. kids and all the kinds of things that mm -hmm. we hear about. But the Kansas Humanities Council, uh, Kansas, Mississippi Humanities mm -hmm. Council was actively involved in that. Mm -hmm. And as I said, got all kinds of, and I know the Mississippi Reads, a big read or whatever it's called, mm -hmm. is a huge program, one of the most successful in the country mm -hmm. in terms of choosing a book, preferably by a Mississippian, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to get people to read. And I know when I've done interviews with people over the years, um, when people get ready to go to college, they always said the one thing that they realized they knew when they would go to schools elsewhere, they knew all the writers in that state. Mm -hmm. Me, as an example, I go to college and I did not know the, the writers in the state of Georgia when I left Georgia. I did not know who they were. But in Mississippi, there is such an infusion of the writers in the state and knowing and reading the work that the Humanities Council does, mm -hmm. that those kids leave wherever they go and they know Mississippi writers. Mm -hmm. There's just no question about it. So I always find it's interesting how they have inserted themselves mm -hmm. into an interesting way, into one, benefiting the state as a whole yes. in terms of the reputational capital that Mississippi has for producing writers, mm -hmm. but also uh, in, in taking advantage of where those low points are you know, low literacy rates, you know, all the kind of stuff that we hear about in Mississippi, by inserting themselves in a positive way. So those partnerships are very interesting. Yeah. You know? 
in addition to the fact that I started my career in Mississippi with Cora Norman, right. who was a founder of the Mississippi <laughs> Unity Council. So, yes. a little, little self, yes. self, self, self. Yes. Uh, Yes. The, the current ED in Mississippi, uh, I believe, has his PhD in American history. Yeah, and he left, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. he left uh, the academy. He was a board member, I believe, for the Mississippi Humanities Council, mm -hmm. and, then, and then became the executive director because he loved yeah. it. So. Yeah. so, other comments or questions? Yes, and tell us who you are. I'm Amanda Snyder, and I'm getting my master's in anthropology. And as you've been talking about you know, the, the projects and everything kind of a broad way, I was wondering if you could walk us through what it looks like from like the first idea for some kind of community involvement to like kind of having contact with the groups to walking it all the way through to actually executing the, the project or the program sure. or whatever. Sure. With a particular example, that would be really helpful. Great. Uh, you know, we do this in, in really two different ways. One, we have what we internally call council conducted resources. So these are kind of pre-packaged, ready to go. So if you are um, the Lawrence Public Library and you want to do a book discussion on uh, encountering Asia, we have that, right? So all you have to do is make that decision, go online, reserve the series, we've got lists of discussion leaders, you contact the discussion leaders, you set up your sign time and dates, you send us, you know, you fill this little form out, we send you some money to pay your discussion leaders, you're good to go, right? So it's really, it's all there for you. Um, same thing with the grant. So if you uh, are the Lawrence Public Library and you decide that you want to do a big exhibition for your lobby about um, protests in Lawrence, Kansas, 1933 to 2000, right? Um, then you can go online and you can apply for a grant and we'll help you through that with the process, but it's really driven completely by the Lawrence Public Library. They come up with the idea, we have the resource, if it gets approved, we'll send you the money, we'll stay in contact, everything's good. So those are ways that we're just sort of, we're here for you as a resource. Now there's other projects like what Danny worked on where we're coming up with the idea. So we have this relationship, for example, with the Smithsonian for Museum on Main Street. It's a pr uh, project that they do for rural communities to get the nation's premier cultural institution into these rural communities. And so we've decided that this is a valuable partnership for us, and so we agreed among staff and among board that the um, topic of water was of great interest. Uh, it is a topic that is discussed all across the state right now. We are having lots of conversations about water and we should be having lots of conversations about water. So this was an idea that staff, it was really staff driven, but we decided we're going to do this. So we made the contract with the Smithsonian about this, set the dates with the Smithsonian and then we said, well, we can't do this alone. So this exhibit has to go into different locations. So our associate director happens to be the Museum on Main Street coordinator for us. And so she created this request for proposals that we sent it out to the communities that basically said, all right, tell us why you're interested in topics. Tell us what your local water story might be. What is it that you're going to talk about? Because we require, if you host the Smithsonian, you have to create a companion exhibit to go along with it. That sort of narrows down what it is that the Smithsonian is talking about. They're up here. The local exhibits need to be funneled in. So there's a lot of work that goes into that creation of the RFP. What's the language? What's important to us? You know, we don't want to ask them to tell us something that we just don't want to use. So we've learned that um, uh, we need to know what are their open hours. You know, this, this has to be open to the public more than like 10 hours a week. You know, those sorts of things. That goes out, maybe a month or a month and a half later, the deadline, so then we get the 2025 applications in. We create a scoring matrix, uh, and we get the map out, and as a staff, we independently score them, a couple of us, um, like, let's see, who, who has a compelling water story? Who was able to tell us something that was important to them? Not the fact that their town was founded in 1888 and their first flood was in 1899 and they've had floods uh, every 20 years since then. That is not interesting to us. Tell us something a little bit more compelling, that there is a story there. So we choose our six, right? 
and then and then it snowballs. So from there, we have to say, okay, here's here's the agreement. So you have to create a signed agreement because when you're talking about money, because we give these organizations money, and you're talking about somebody like the Smithsonian, and they're getting a Smithsonian, you gotta have some legalese in there, right? So that everybody's on the same page. We will do this as KHC. You will do this as as a host site. You promise to do these six things, and we sign. And we sign. Then we have to have some sort of planning meeting. So we bring the someone from the Smithsonian to come in, and we provide lots of resources. So in this case, um, one of the things that Danny was doing is that we had so many good applications from organizations wanting to host the Smithsonian that had good solid water stories that we decided to open it up to uh, offer some small grant funds if they wanted to become a partner site, which means they wouldn't be, get to host a Smithsonian exhibit, but we would um, co-promote uh, them. So, right, so that you know you could be part of this big water initiative that we wanted to do. Because now all of a sudden we've decided we have moved beyond just inviting the Smithsonian to come to our state. We now have an initiative, right? So this is big. So we're meeting with the Kansas Water Office people. We're meeting with the Kansas Department of Agriculture. We're meeting with the Kansas Geological Survey. We're meeting with whoever it is that are the keepers of the water stories for our state. Um, we'll be going to the governor's water conference. We're, you know, we're all about water. <laughs> now we've created. Who would have thought? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Water yeah. Conference. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Danny was helping us being able to isolate the humanity's story within this concept of water, right? Whether it's recreation, whether it's religious traditions, whatever it might be, everything we do has something in some way to do with water. Right? So how are we going to tell these stories? So that's what Danny did. So we were lucky enough. We were planning ahead. We're like, we got to get an intern because nobody on staff. We're too, you know, when you when you run a nonprofit, you know, you your little slice of the humanities just like wants to shrink. Right? You go into <laughs> it because your interest is this big, and then all of a sudden you're like, you know, you're getting into program development. I'm like, oh, let's get an intern. Um, so you then so there's lots and lots of writing. Right? So this could be you know newsletter, blogs tweets, whatever. Got, we got to get this. So now we have to have a planning meeting because we're working with these, you know, what, what 15, 14, 15. 15 communities and they know their water story, they don't know each other's, and they certainly don't know what it is that's missing. So now we have to plan a planning meeting. Plan for a plan, right? Um, so who do we need to invite? That takes a lot of time. So Rex from the Geological Survey is coming, and so-and-so is coming from the Kansas Water Office, and the Department of Agriculture is coming, and all of our hosts and all of our partner sites are coming. Someone from the Smithsonian is coming. Someone is going to come and talk to us about exhibit development, how you create a local exhibit that's meaningful for not a whole lot of money. Okay, that sounds good. All right, but, you know, let's make it bigger, right? You know, it's a statewide initiative. So, okay, so we've got the Smithsonian coming to six sites. We've got nine other communities that are getting a little bit of money to also create exhibits about water. So we're going to cross-promote, cross-promote, cross-promote. Everybody's going to love it. Um, but, you know, there might be other communities who want to get into this water conversation because this is a really big conversation for our state. You know, the Farmers and industries, we've got a diminishing aquifer, we've got sedimentation building up, it impacts our lives, who we are and how we live it, right? You know, it's not just necessarily about turning on the tap and getting water, it's everything we do and how we live, and it always has been. You know, our values and traditions of Kansans are really tied into the access to water. So, you know, 15 communities out of the whole state, that's not enough. So let's create some other resources. So now we have um, special speakers, 10 or 12, from all around the state, from KU, from K-State, from Emporia State, who are talking about water uh, that will be available to travel around the state. And we've created a special book discussion series looking at land and water stewardship. So they'll be reading for anybody who wants to. Uh, in the series, we've got... Um, uh, Hoot, and I just read these two, um, Aldo Leopold's famous book, Sand County, Almanac, and Zaytoon about the flood in Katrina, yeah. from Hurricane Katrina, so we'll be able to have great discussions about water and stewardship in those sorts of ways. Um, and so then we created, last year, through a whole Center for the Humanities, some of you might know Elise Binsel, 
Uh, she wrote some readers' theater scripts for us, looking at the history of mm -hmm. land and water stewardship in mm -hmm. Kansas. We've got five going on, so that people can do these readers' theaters in their own communities. We have funded a couple of films about water in Kansas, believe it or not. One's called When the Well Runs Dry, runs dry and it's mm -hmm. just this just beautiful uh, film by Stephen Lerner here in town about water in the foothills. Just a great humanities discussion, ready to go. So now all of a sudden we've got all these resources for more Kansans to get involved with, yeah. right? Uh, and in the meantime now, so we've got that created, we're also fundraising for it. Right? <laughs> so all of this is happening. We started this project in earnest in January. Um, we're sort of the bulge in the middle of the snake right now. Uh, it opens in Kansas in June of 2017. Mm -hmm. So this is a year and a half just to get the planning and all the resources lined up. And you know we're we're feeling the push, right? So when we get this done, what's next? I'm not sure. We just ran across um, the National Park Service as offering a big grant um, for civil rights work in your state. And let's say, well, do we go for it? For like, okay, what are we going to do after water? Because you know we like to be in charge of our own destiny too. So what is it that we think that we can tap into in our state? So. Um, when you are working with partners, and you know, true partners are means you have to compromise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Stuff always takes a really long time. At least it seems like this. I mean, you know, for Danny to write these things, knowing that they're not really going to be out there in the public until June, seems mm -hmm. crazy. But we know if we don't get that done, that's the thing that just sort of slips away, mm -hmm. right? Because you're just like, oh, you know, writing all the time, right? You know. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of a long, long way around. Every project is different. They always take very long. We never do anything alone. Um, we always have, always have partners. And sometimes they succeed and sometimes they fail and you have to start over, but we always are working with others. And our whole idea is like, let's model what it is that we want to see and let's help elevate the conversation and let's help elevate the capacity of our communities that we work with in hopes that we can go back to what we started with, that wouldn't it be great if we lived in a state where we didn't need to be? Because every community had such great support for the arts and humanities in their town. Yeah, may I attach something to that for clarification? So you learned that the National Park Service has an initiative and there's money associated right. with it. So, or the National uh, 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 NEH has an initiative, or the Smithsonian has an initiative, right. but you still have to apply right. to get that allocation of yes. funding. Yes, yes. So it's not automatic. It is not automatic. So right. central to almost everything right. is the grant writing process yes. <laughs> and the application process. Right. Yes. You know, it really is interesting how you can see something, you know, it's perfect for you, mm -hmm. absolutely perfect, but there's a path. I'm getting yes. there. Mm -hmm. yes. And it's not automatic. Right. I mean, nice it would be, but it's not. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you have to gauge it with your priorities. Like, is this something we want to go for? Because if we get it, we're going for it. <laughs> you know? yeah. so, All hands on deck. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but uh, yeah, so how does it fit in with your priorities? You fit in with your staffing, fit in with your um, vision, you know, your strategic plan, whatever it might be. We tend to work, you know, three to five years out as much as we can. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, but yet you still want to be as nimble as you can so that you can respond to opportunities that are too good to pass up. And one of the things, we had a mini retreat with the staff, a couple of us on staff the other day, and we talked about, you know, what becomes a distraction and what do we need to focus on, you know, and so often it's easy to just sort of like, if somebody waves you a little bit of money, you're like, oh, let's go, you know, and it's like, you know, sticking to your core principles and sticking to uh, what it is that you have identified as your priorities or your goals or your objectives for, for your organization. So I have to revise my earlier question when I said <laughs> they're operating kind of as in their own you know, turf here, but in fact you are competing mm -hmm. with other humanities councils, mm -hmm. state humanities councils, right. and others who want to apply right. for these initiatives that might be yes. available where there's some guaranteed amount of money, right. but it's just not given to you right. automatically. So there is that element yes. going on. So it seems like you're, you right. know, in a space all to yourself. Right. But in fact, 
There's the other part of it. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. right. Funding-wise, it's always competitive. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. Existence-wise, yeah. mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. More questions? Yeah, yes. Um, did, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, Introduce. I'm Anthony Boynton, first-year PhD student. Um, how do you become a part of the um, a part of the speakers, speakers or like um, do you do you all contract your own speakers or is there an application process? Or? Right, uh, a little bit of both. So what okay. we'll be doing is um, we generally do sort of a call for scholars. So for example, usually about every other year, every two years, we recreate a new speakers bureau. Mm -hmm. We don't do it every year because it's a massive amount of work, right. as you can imagine. <laughs> uh, so when we just <coughs> send it out, we circulate it um, generally through kind of our, our friends and family that we know, right? You know, your board members, your former board members, your affiliations at the universities and others, and say, you know, sort of pass this around to your fellow faculty or your graduate teaching assistants or whoever it is that you think might be interested in this work. And it's competitive. Everything we do, of course, is competitive. We always get more. We're in a great, great area where we always get more than we can uh, handle, right? And um, so we'll do that. We'll do the same thing with our book discussion leaders, those sorts of things. And so uh, what you'll want to do probably is go online and sign up for our e-news and follow us on e-news. Or shoot me an email and we'll put you on the list to make sure that the next time we do a call that you'll get that information. Okay. So and we have had uh, Doretha Williams mm -hmm. was one of your speakers yes. bureau and she did a lot of work because she was working on Kansas newspapers and Kansas mm -hmm. women's clubs, black women's clubs in Kansas and she went all over the state mm -hmm. speaking and this was part of her dissertation. Mm -hmm. So there was an interesting you know, right. intersection between what she was doing and what she was sharing. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So. We can't guarantee that you'll go out. I mean, you're sort of in some ways in competition with the yeah. other people in the speakers bureau. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's a good a good opportunity for you to kind of play around with public writing in terms of what appeals to the public. If you call something that sounds like a dissertation, I can guarantee you that it won't go out for the public because they'll want to pick something else, right? Um, so Kate Meyer at the Spencer Museum of Art, when she was not finished with her PhD, but she was working on, I think she was uh, working for the Spencer at the time, she was doing something with um, uh, Kansas art of the 1930s, and mm. boom, she went everywhere. Oh, no. There was, because <laughs> yes, yes, yes. it was Hot and topic. it was history, and it was the 30s, and then we were the prairie printmakers, and it was like there was just this whole just cache of really interesting thing. And I think we may have burned her out. Like she's never, she will never come back to us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I kept telling her, like, Kate, hey, you can say no. You know, you can yeah. say no. It's you know, we always we're not, we don't handle the scheduling, we don't do any of that. But uh, you know, you're on your own. But yeah. So, Casey, last question. Does anyone else have a question? Anybody else? I'm not? Oh, let's go ahead. <laughs> All right. I'm Candace. I'm a third year PhD mm -hmm. in creative writing. And I was just wondering, kind of in line with what you just said mm -hmm. about the writing process and what makes um, something appeal to the community, what kind of hallmarks are there of a good project proposal or grant proposal? <laughs> that's, that's a great question. And I used to always in my head when we would be writing or, or editing um, entries for our Speakers Bureau catalog, for example, I'm like, could I stand in the middle of the little cafe in my hometown and read this out loud? Mm -hmm. Without people going, what? You know, right? You know? And that doesn't mean that it is by any means remedial writing. Right. It's just a different way of writing. Right? That there, there's a, a level of excitement, that there's a level of engagement in us in it. You know, join us as we're talking about this, an invitation, you know, to come and learn about your topic, whether it might be, you know, 18th century art history or something, but that there's a reason, there's a connection made between that topic and our lives. Right. So in terms of when you're writing something like that. Just think think about that. You are not writing to this group of people in this room right now. You are writing to a group of people who might be, um, you know, hanging out for donuts in the church basement. So I was in Tonganoxa, Kansas last week at the Historical Society. It's a collection of historic buildings from their area. 
uh, and they were hosting a Speakers Bureau event called Make Art Not War, and it was about um, protest art in Kansas. Mm -hmm. um, so we were in a, a little restored church, and we're watching a little PowerPoint. Erica Nelson, who is um, an artist herself and a great um, humanist from KU background, and she was sort of talking about how protests um, are reflected in artwork and science mm -hmm. and all sorts of things. And so here we are, small town America, and we're talking about Dinsmore and his work at the Garden of Eden in Lucas, Kansas, and what he was commenting on. And then we move into the wonderful John Stuart Curry murals of John Brown and others in the mm -hmm. State House, talking about John Brown as a protest symbol himself. And then up on the screen, we see the signs affiliated with Fred Phelps. You know, talking about that, if you're familiar with him and his hatred of almost all things, uh, the Phelps family. And we transition from that into um, artwork from Grandma Layton, who was a self-taught artist from Ottawa, mm -hmm. and sort of her artwork as a protest against the treatment of those with uh, mental health issues. Uh, and then rolled right into N.T. Liggett, who is a folk art um, artist from central and western Kansas, whose protest art is very visible. He puts it on fence posts right along the highway for everyone to see. Mm. So when you're thinking about that, you're, the, the public that night uh, was very interested and curious. I mean, that's, that's who comes, people who are, have curious minds. They don't want to be spoken down to. They often have masters and PhDs themselves. They've chosen other careers where they might be retired from these careers. Uh, they want to be talked to at a level that makes sense to them in their leisure time, right? Mm -hmm. This is they're doing it because they want to be there, right? You know, um, grant writing. That's um, grant writing. You just have to know who you're writing for. Mm -hmm. So a grant to us. Um, we want a we want a story, and we want your narrative to match your budget, right? So those are kind of the things that that we want. Mm -hmm. When you write for NEH, you are going to want to write a little bit different. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Mark is going to come back and talk to us. Again. Yeah, I was say, I'm not going to tell you what, but that's a whole <laughs> different audience. If you write a grant for the Kansas Health Foundation, you're going to want to change your language even differently with them. Um, Long story short, I would always ask, is if you can, ask the granting organization to send you a sample successful grant application so you can see the tone and the language that was used that was successful at that time. And then you kind of get a sense of it's formal, it's informal, it's, you know, whatever it might be. So, Casey, you want to ask your final question? It was, it was geared to Danny. Oh, cool. okay, great. Um, I was just wondering, like, what was something unexpected that you learned in your internship? Like, this is something that's really, like, applied humanities and public humanities. Like, what did you go in thinking you were going to do, and what was, what did you find surprising about your experience? I, I think this is, and this is not a bad thing, I was surprised by how hard it was. This is actually a tough <laughs> thing um, Because, like, none of the story, like, I think just, like, the... The writing, like for for grants and for for advertising and marketing, that Julie was just talking about, I had to be hyper aware of audience too, in my writing. So I found myself it was there's a pretty steep learning curve about how to crank out these blog posts. And at the beginning, I was getting everything was coming back with a lot of feedback, um, and it it took a, a second to get used to. Um, being fair to the like because it was stories that the the town the places had picked and then I had it was I was just kind of turning them into the blog post format and like trying to add some narrative momentum to something that might not have necessarily had but it's it's different I mean you're in rhetoric you know the story for a grant application is different than a blog post and, um, so it was it was just in it was an amazingly challenging summer, and it was it was good. It was super rewarding because of that, um, and like, you know, knowing that some of these aren't going to get waterways until like February 2018, wow. and like, emailing a very overworked um, museum employee mm -hmm. in Central Kansas asking them to think 18 months in advance, <laughs> yeah. um, and like, stop what you're doing right. and send me some old newspaper <laughs> right. articles. Right. 
Uh, so it was always, it, much more than what I do in my writing here, it was the audience was always hyper-present. Um, but that's a really good lesson. Because, I mean, and that's stuff you can apply to writing grants, to doing marketing, to doing right. all that kind of stuff that's mm -hmm. in any kind of public humanities writing. I think you need to be aware of your audience. And that, I can hit that wall pretty hard in my first couple weeks. <laughs> yeah, we needed Danny it. to um, mirror and be consistent with the voice that we use in all of our writing. But at the same time, he also had to satisfy those organizations we were working with. Mm -hmm. We have a really um, strong sense that if we are using stories from another community, we want the communities to sign off on what it is, right. how we're describing who they are. Because ultimately, we are sharing that story with them. Uh, and so that can be challenging, to, and Danny yeah. saw that, to be able to balance both of those things to do what it is that we want to do in terms of following our model and our voice, but also being respectful of that local voice, too. So it, it is challenging. Yeah. yeah. Well, I want to thank you. This is even richer the second time around. <laughs> I have to say, I'll just reiterate one thing you said and reminded me of. I mean, I've been in the Academy for 30 years, and I can pretty much predict what's going to happen in terms of a, when I give a speech to an academic audience, I can pretty much know that person is going to say this. Uh -huh. I have never been able to predict the kinds of questions that are mm -hmm. going to come when I'm on a, a, you know, NEH or a Kansas Humanities or any kind of state humanities project. You know, you go into an audience, you have no idea what's going to come. Mm -hmm. And so the kind of honesty and openness mm -hmm. that you, it, it's humbling. Mm -hmm. I have to say it's humbling. Yes. So here you are this haughty, haughty professor coming into a place, and you get brought down pretty quickly. <laughs> Can you tell me this? Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, uh, duh, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So it's a really good experience to keep your balance in terms of what you do and the purpose you serve uh, and who the real people are. So stepping in and out of that role has been very rewarding for me because if, if ever I forget I'm always reminded <laughs> somebody is listening and is yeah. going to challenge me on it in every turn. And so I really love that. Yeah. Um, thank, thank you. Thank you.